Welcome to this audio file of the World Affairs Talk Beyond the Myth of the Apolitical Actor, The Case for the British Military, given by Professor Paul Highgate from the University of Bath on the Tuesday, the 20th of April, 2021. The reason that this is an audio rather than the usual video file is that we had problems with the recording of the Zoom meeting. The audio track has also been built from three separate recordings, so please forgive any small discontinuities. Paul Highgate is Professor of Conflict and Security at Bath. He spent eight years in the RAF, starting as a young recruit in 1983. He went to the University of Glasgow as a mature student in 1991 and subsequently to the University of York for his PhD. He spent 17 years at the University of Bristol before coming to Bath in 2017. Paul, thank you very much for joining us to give this talk. Well, many thanks, David. It's a great privilege to be here uh, tonight, and um, I'm really looking forward to um, you know having a, having a lively discussion with everybody. And thanks too for coming along. Um, it's uh, it's a great privilege to be here and to be given the you know time and opportunity to talk about my work. Um, I mean, just just really to to add some uh, flesh to the bones of, of what David mentioned. Uh, and my research has um, over the last 20, 25 years has looked in depth at questions of, uh, of the military, in in particular the British military, and specifically questions around gender and in you know, a perhaps less orthodox sense, questions around uh, military masculinity. Uh, um, now, the, the focus on military masculinity came from my PhD, um, where I looked at the experiences of those leaving the British Army who ended up sleeping rough. Um, and they, are, they do form a, a significant uh, proportion of the rough sleeping population. Um, now, this work, uh, th this kind of focus I used on military masculinity allowed me to explain some of the ways in which these individuals were both sustained in uh, homelessness, as a, a, given that they were able to survive and cope physically and mentally with the hardship, uh, and also allowed me to understand some of the links between you know, service in the British Army um, and some of the, the problems that may create for those leaving um, without much of a safety net. Using the question of military masculinity, to explain particular social phenomena, I've then looked at the situation of UN peacekeepers uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world and their relationships with local women, in particular sexual exploitation and uh, um, abuse of local women in various ways. Uh, again, this was a kind of topic of concern in the early 2000s and it comes and goes in terms of media coverage. And also I've looked at the question of military masculinity in private military security companies. Uh, and again, we're aware, perhaps some of us, companies like Blackwater, who operated in Iraq in 2003 on, uh, and in Afghanistan, created all sorts of problems for local populations, not least uh, resulting in the Nisor Square massacre in 2007. So my work has kind of cohered around questions of military masculinity, but has moved more recently into a more kind of critical register to focus on questions of militarization and militarism in British society. And that really is the kind of uh, backbone of the talk tonight, um, whereby I'm looking at some of the ways in which the, the British Armed Forces uh, has promoted itself in wider British society, continues to do so. Uh, and in the broader sense, it raises questions of the political kind of relationship of the armed forces to wider society. So hopefully that's provided a, a kind of brief uh, backdrop to the talk and to my own work. Um, but I just wanted to start actually tonight by just reading this quote out actually which is from a 2015 YouGov poll and uh, the findings were as follows the question and findings were as follows do you think there would be any situation uh, addressed uh, to the uh, the um, those being polled however unlikely it might be in which you could imagine yourself supporting the British Armed Forces taking over the powers of government now, a quarter of British people said yes, and among UKIP supporters in particular, the number rose to 44%. And subsequent polls um, over the years reproduced these kinds of findings, whereby the armed forces is, is noted to be an incredibly uh, highly respected institution of British society. 
Um, and it's against that backdrop, really, that this this talk is 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 going to be kind of played out tonight. Over the powers of government. Now, a quarter of British people said yes, and among UKIP supporters, the number rose to 44 percent. So I think immediately we can see that the armed forces are an incredibly popular and highly respected institution within British society. Um, and and the, you know, similar kinds of polls reproduce these kinds of results. Um, but what I want to do tonight is dive in really to, to, to some of the kind of ways in which politics um, plays out otherwise, if you like. So looking at those kinds of assumptions we might have about the armed forces in ways that problematize the kind of political dimension. I, I want to start really by uh, you know, asking how it is we make sense of the contempor contemporary political climate and the place of the armed forces within it. Now, one place to start and of direct relevance to the current presentation is the language used to frame the 2021 integrated review. Although its substantive content is interesting, I'm going to reflect briefly on the framing of this document. Notions such as the UK as a player on the world stage that requires its armed forces to be match fit, a force for good, and a global influencer animate the review. This rhetoric undergirds the decision not only to expand the nuclear stockpile, itself I would argue an expression of national crisis, but more crucially is used to legitimate the above inflation funding pay rise of armed service personnel by 2.6%, which is in stark contrast to the derisory pay cut of 1% offered to nurses, despite the truly critical life-saving work they've performed over the last year. This hyperbole challenges with other such sloganeering that litters the review, for instance, punching above one's weight and sustaining one's role in the world, that taken together are aspirations that can never be audited. Furthermore, slogans such as this will do nothing to arrest what I see as the protracted decline of the UK, a process that Tom Nairn and Perry Anderson have traced back to at least the 1880s and the height of the Industrial Revolution. One has only to think of the disastrous outcomes of recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, and no matter how we dress these up, I think the outcomes are truly tragic, as well as the death of at least 160,000 due to COVID-19, which is one of the highest per capita in the world. And it's corollary, according to former chief scientist David King, of corruption and squandered resources that dovetails, and in an ironic sense at least, with world-beating inequality that is unlikely to be alleviated anytime soon, given the distinct absence of an effective opposition party. Now, allied to a weak and sycophantic media, it's not difficult to see how the UK decline has intensified in recent years. It's empirically demonstrable in the starkest of terms. On almost every social and economic indicator, as rigorously documented by Danny Dawling and many others, the UK lags well behind its European comparative states. The idea of a global Britain is just that. It's an idea intended to gird the loins that is premised on a flawed understanding of the colonial economic trajectory of Great Britain whose success was rooted not on a buccaneering past, but rather on one of brutal resource extraction, protected empire markets, and genocide dressed up as beneficent intervention. Yet, the best defence of a free country, as Simon Jenkins recently argued, is one characterised by a robust economy, an open border and civil rights. In contrast, we're living through a heightened colonial present, where a romanticised nostalgia has attained hegemony, and, for example, Institutional racism is disavowed, and I'll come to that later. This, despite the fact, despite the fact that, to take one of many possible indicators, the 40% unemployment amongst black workers in Brixton is the same as it was during the first riots some 40 years ago. Okay, this highly critical overview of the current context um, provides a contemporary sense of the political maze, malaise that provides some background for what I now turn to. The extent to which the UK armed forces can be said to be democratically accountable, or rather might be seen as an arena of both covert and overt politicking. In order to do this, I focus on the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, the UK is a constitutional monarchy. Queen Elizabeth II is the head of state and commander in chief of the armed forces. She holds supreme command of the armed forces. However, unlike other Commonwealth realms, such as Australia, Australia with the Australia Act 1986 and Canada with the Canada Act 1982, the UK still has the royal prerogative. 
The Royal Prerogative is the customary authority and privilege recognised in the United Kingdom as the sole prerogative of the sovereign. This prerogative extends to defence, foreign affairs and national security. Now, since the 19th century, the Royal Prerogative power has been vested in the Prime Minister, currently Boris Johnson, and his advice and potentially that of the Cabinet, who in turn are accountable to Parliament, is central to decisions around the deployment of the armed forces and firing of nuclear weapons. In exceptional circumstances, the monarch remains constitutionally empowered to exercise the royal prerogative against the advice of the prime minister or cabinet. Essentially, the prime minister can order the firing of the UK, UK's nuclear weapons and, without the approval of parliament, send the country to war. However, it is unlikely he, in this case, would do so without consulting the queen, who is currently kept in the loop with government affairs by a way of a weekly audience with the prime minister. The Queen remains the ultimate authority of the armed forces, and as such, those enlisting into the Navy, Army or Air Force are required to swear allegiance to the monarch. In reality, however, the Queen is little more than a figurehead, and while we might be reassured that the book rests with her in regard to questions of national security, recent events suggest otherwise. For example, when Johnson asked the Queen to prorogue Parliament in 2019, it was clear she, that she had no meaningful possibility to resist. To do so would have profoundly undermined the government. This would suggest that the Queen's real role is to do what the Prime Minister tells her, and in this sense we might see her as working to do the Prime Minister's bidding. In fact, the Queen is ceremonial head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces in name only, with her actual influence manifest in supporting the political status quo and the wider system itself. However, in an alternative scenario, an elected head of state's neutrality would be prescribed by law and could be genuinely independent of government, acting as an impartial referee of the political system and an extra check on the power of government. It follows that if there is a risk that the use of nuclear weapons or deployment of the armed forces may be believed to breach fundamental rights or principles, a head of state might refer it to the Supreme Court. Alternatively, alternatively if there is a widespread public opposition to a particular deployment, as noted in the presence of around 2 million people marching in London against the invasion of Iraq in 2003, an alternative, more democratic path might be found. In this sense, an elected head of state is likely to be more inclusive and unifying, and in so doing, represent the wider democratic desires of the state in question, i.e. the UK. As it stands, the UK is fairly distinctive in the ways that the power is concentrated in the hands of a very small number of elites who, in turn, are drawn from a tiny fraction of society marked by economic, social and cultural privilege. OK, we could say, so what? The Queen is a taxpayer-funded figurehead. At least we have Parliament to act as a key check and balance to such vital decisions as deploying the armed forces that, in turn, support the use of military violence. Yet even here, we note that there are serious questions to be asked about the extent to which armed forces are democratically accountable to the executive. Now, the work of many scholars, amongst which Paul Dixon has been extremely influential and on whose work I draw extensively here, demonstrates quite clearly that the deeper reasons animating the deployment of the armed forces do not rest solely with Parliament and indeed have been shown to be profoundly undemocratic. He asked the question, who chose to go to war in Afghanistan and Iraq? Now, as the Shilcott inquiry established and a point to which we will return, the military themselves pushed hard for it. Although Shilcott provides provided evidence of the military's role in seeking maximum, maximum involvement in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. This was largely unreported, with the exception of people like Max Hastings, Mark Irvin and Deborah Haynes. At this time, and in a broader sense, the US Secretary of Defence, Donald Rumsfeld, saw the role of the British Armed Forces as mainly symbolic, and in turn was not persuaded that they should be deployed, a belief that was lobbied against by the British Army as a further way in which to protect the defence budget. As Dixon notes, on the 12th of October 2006, General Dannett launched the militarisation offensive with a stinging public attack on the Labour government in an interview for the Daily Mail. He claimed that the politicians had failed to properly fund the military, respect the sacrifices of the armed forces and put the country on a war footing to rally public support for the war in Afghanistan. As the academic Anthony King states, reports suggest that senior commanders in the army were desperate to get involved in a popular war before the next strategic defence review in order to promote themselves over the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force. In 2005, Helmand was seen as that potentially popular war. 
Further, and counter to a number of predictions prior to the invasion of Afghanistan, was the idea that the mission would be largely driven by peace building. Yet the army, perhaps unsurprisingly, were fully aware that this intervention was primarily about war fighting in the traditional sense. General David Richards, who deputized for the head of the army, as Dixon notes, lobbied hard for the army's involvement, even though he was uneasy about the war and regards it with the benefit of hindsight as a grand strategic error. The military claimed that the army's morale would suffer if it was not included in the invasion force. As also argued by Dixon and reiterated here, Dannett's attack on the Labour Party undermined the constitutional convention that the military do not publicly criticise policy, yet Tony Blair was not in a position to sack him and in order to assuage public opinion, publicly stated that he agreed with Dannett. In the USA and in sharp contrast, as Dixon also notes, President Obama did not shrink from removing General Crystal, General McChrystal in 2010 after his disparaging private remarks on politicians were published in Rolling Stone magazine. Similarly, Gordon Brown also found it difficult to rein in military ambitions and was argued to be just about managing pressures from the military and media generated public opinion. Dixon documents pressures experienced by other prime ministers, including David Cameron, and his decision as a consequence to adhere to the 2% GDP on defence spending. Now, in the academic Hugh Bennett's review of the Chilcot Inquiry, or oral evidence, he argues that the pro Hellman lobby, represented by Generals Walker, Jackson, Dannett and Fry, brushed aside doubts raised by military and civilian leaders. The Hellman decision suggests weak civilian control of the armed forces and the triumph of military amateurism. However, what Dixon labels the Westminster interpretation of British politics points to the traditional model of accountability discussed earlier whereby it is the government through the democratically elected representatives of the people that have power and therefore responsibility for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Crucially, he reminds us that the Westminster interpretation elides the diffusion of power within the British state among powerful organisations such as the military, the civil service, the MOD, the Foreign Office and Department for International Development, along with the media, pressure groups, think tanks, academia and the public that taken together shape policies in ways that usurp the executive. The Westminster model deflects from the influence of the military in lobbying for its own involvement and projects it towards the politicians who are then held accountable. Hugh Strawn states that rather than civilians colonising the military, the military have colonised the civilians. The former Prime Minister Gordon Brown criticised Dannett for crossing a line public by publicly identifying with the Conservative Party. He quotes a constitutional expert, to abandon the principle of a non-political army would be a catastrophe. In underscoring this situation, in, in underscoring this situation Sherard Coper Cowes argues that a trend has been set where an overconfident and undermanaged military machine fills a vacuum left by politicians, civil servants and diplomats, unable or unwilling to provide firm strategic direction. The military is not just doing the fighting, but increasingly it is allowed to decide the overall direction of the campaign. Now, according to one MOD official, ministers were advised not to try to reverse decisions that had been made in military circles sometime previously. The tail was wagging the dog. Coalition military politics were driving national strategic interest. With hindsight, my impression is that diplomacy and politics followed rather tamely. Now, the role of the armed forces in lobbying and involvement can be explained by attempts to advance their organizational interests by securing a greater share of public expenditure raising their profile and building up their prestige. The military sought involvement in two wars, knowing they had only been only planned to be involved in one. They lobbied for maximum involvement in the Iraq war, knowing that this would break the so-called harmony guidelines, protecting military personnel from overdeployment. This was made worse by the military's subsequent pursuit of the deployment to Hellman in 2006. The military also had an understanding of and some responsibility for the inadequate equipment and troop numbers that were available for these missions. While the role of Dunnett can be seen as problematic with regard to what might be read as undermining the accountability of the armed forces in a more anecdotal sense and further underscoring the role of the armed forces in the political realm, it was reported in 2015 in the, in the Independent that a senior serving general has warned that if, Jeremy, if a Jeremy Corbyn government could face a mutiny from the army if, try, if tried to downgrade them. The unnamed general said members of the armed forces would 
would begin directly and publicly challenging the Labour leader if he tried to scrap Trident, pull out of NATO or announce any plans to emasculate and shrink the size of the armed forces. The officer was alleged to have said the army just wouldn't stand for it. The general staff would not allow a prime minister to jeopardise the security of this country. And I think people would use whatever means, fair or foul, to prevent this. You can't put a maverick in charge of a country's security. Now, these exemplars speak to the democratic deficit of the heart of the state that are noted to play out in both structural and more spontaneous ways, as indicated in the case of Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, albeit briefly, we turn to a further dimension of this democratic deficit, as attested to in the recent Overseas Operations Bill. The wider context for the bill is that of the status of the UK Special Forces, forces that, as Carl Hode Perdison and Walpole argue, is of significant concern. They argue that despite evidence of increased deployments of British Special Forces over the last two decades, the UK Parliament still has no mechanism to provide oversight. To add to this, the government has maintained a long-held policy not to comment on its Special Forces, a boilerplate response ministers employ whenever questions are raised. And while this plausible deni deniability has a long history tainted by widespread human rights abuses and the treatment of the Mau Mau in Kenya by the British military and the role of the so-called Kini Mini private military and security company, itself provided with tacit approval by elements within the British government in training the Sri Lankan police who then went on to perpetrate human rights abuses, including the widely used necklacing of the Tamil Tigers through burning them alive, is a further case in point of deeply questionable foreign policy intervention. It's worth stating that the UK st currently stands out amongst its allies in its failure to introduce any form of external oversight of its special forces. The logics following these depoliticised interventions also shape, as I've said, the current, con current context as evidence in the case of the Overseas Operations Bill that has recently passed its third reading and is currently with the House of Lords. Now, the Overseas Operations Bill will bring into British law a legal presumption against prosecution in serious criminal cases involving service, person service personnel overseas, where five years have passed since the date of the alleged crime and will restrict the circumstances in which legal claims against the Ministry of Defence can be brought after the primary limitation period has passed. It's generated considerable outcry, even from those at the heart of the pro-military establishment, including the service services charity, the Royal British Legion. Now, in commenting on this bill, Kate Allen, Amnesty International UK's director, said, the government's overseas operations bill will do irreparable damage to the reputation of the armed forces of this country, undermine basic principles of access to justice and send a bad message internationally. In placing the actions of soldiers above the law, the government is implying our armed forces need impunity for allegations of torture and war crimes, and that we think it's OK to grant them that. This attempt to exceptionalise armed forces with regards to accountability proceed according to earlier logics, central to the attempts to push the so-called militarisation offensive, as noted earlier. The point here is that the creeping militarisation of British society that has intensified in recent years rests on the idea that the armed forces are exceptional and that this is part of their problem vis-à-vis -vis wider public understanding. Within the context of educating a so-called naive public that, whilst recognising the armed forces as a distinct institutional entity, is be believed to have only a poor understanding of its people, the duties they perform, and the uniqueness of military careers and lifestyle. A key intervention in these efforts to correct presumed deficits in the public consciousness was presented in the document published in 2008 uh, entitled Report of Inquiry into the National Recognition of Our Armed Forces. Its policy highlights, some of which have gained considerable traction in recent years, include increasing armed forces visibility through the wider use of uniforms in public, a more systematic and formalised approach to homecoming parades, and the implementation of British Armed Forces and Veterans Days. The armed forces aim to improve contact through annual public outreach programmes, public outreach uh, obligations for the reserve forces, open days, greater interaction with the media, local government and civic bodies. And in order to so-called build understanding, they are encouraging MPs to visit combat zones, the use of parliamentary orientation courses for officers of the armed forces, officer secondment to the House of Commons, defence seminars for chief executives, increase in combined cadet forces for comprehensive schools and other measures to strengthen cadet forces.
including military approved material and the national curriculum. Other initiatives that we'll expand on below are also worthy of mention that in a broader sense, flow from the idea that military ways of being and doing are superior to those found in the civilian sphere. And that indeed can be very, very usefully, usefully mobilized by young people. I'm thinking here of Michael, Go Michael Gove's emphasis whilst education secretary on the value of military ethos that manifested itself in numerous policies, including the so-called Troops to Teachers programme. This provided subsidies for teacher training as well as a fast track through to the status of qualified teacher. It was assumed that his or her, invariably his, experience of military life naturally equipped such individuals to engage productively with particularly challenging children, implicitly boys, from poor socioeconomic backgrounds, their life chances further undermined by a protracted period of austerity throughout the period that lacked discipline and direction and could be helped by indoctrinating them with a particular kind of militarised masculinity. The armed forces growing preoccupation with children in recent years through attempts to militarise and politicise this cohort is worthy of greater consideration since not only are they of particular appeal to recruiters given the chronic shortfalls in army personnel in particular, but in addition they have or should be granted exceptional status on account of their youth. While some might argue that the armed forces are well placed to offer particularly disadvantaged young people access to a career, life skills, professional training and a sense of self-worth that they might otherwise be deprived of in an insecure civilian economy, the risks of recruiting children are numerous and are largely overlooked by the armed forces. It is for the reasons that I now expand upon that the state's duty of care to the approximately one quarter of those under the age of 18 who enlist in the armed forces every year has been neglected in ways that should be of real concern. This line of inquiry raises the question of armed forces accountability that runs in tandem with their attempt to both militarise and therefore politicise vulnerable children. With findings illustrative of similar reports focused on the experiences of child soldiers in the UK, the work by the organisation MEDACT entitled The Recruitment of Children by the UK Armed Forces identifies the following concerns that underscore the damaging policy of recruiting those under 18 years of age that incidentally is a practice that no other country in Europe uses. Only 46 other countries around the, around the world recruit under 18s. They include Pakistan, El Salvador, Zambia, Cuba and Tonga, amongst others. Now, recruiting of children occurs during the height of adolescent development for many. As the report authors indicate, decision making amongst those undergoing the transition to adult are more likely to be influenced by emotional and social drivers that dispose them towards risk-taking activities. Individual and environmental risk factors combined, combined with adolescent neurobiological changes render this cohort as, being, cohort as being far more vulnerable to external influence and pressure in ways that can lead to poorly informed decision-making. This is especially problematic given that the commitment to military service lasts at a minimum, at a minimum for many years. Now, my own experiences of being recruited in the latter years of my 16th year and enlistment at the age of 17 years and two months invoke current practices, current recruiting practices, whereby the service is presented in a sanitised uh, light as a life of adventure, travel, security and self-actualisation. Whilst it's fair to say I got away quite lightly compared to many others, I still experienced huge challenges in attempting to leave the Air Force uh, in a little over eight years, with a little uh, over eight years of service under my belt. Furthermore, I carried the institution in my thinking and actions in ways that did me few favours during my early civilian years. Now, those recruited as children are more likely than adult recruits to end up in frontline combat, and as such, are put at a greater risk of experiencing some form of physical or psychological trauma. They are more likely to be killed with fatality rates of the frontline infantry in Afghanistan seven times higher than the rest of the armed forces. Those enlisting at 16 were twice as likely to be killed or injured in Afghanistan in comparison to others who signed up at 18 or over. Given that the armed forces and in the, this example, the army targets those who have endured the greatest degree of childhood adversity prior to enlistment, it's important to note that among Iraq war veterans in the UK, this group were nearly four times more likely to manifest PTSD than those without this background. So-called hazardous drinking amongst military men is nearly twice as prevalent as that in the wider civilian population, with those of a younger age at greater risk of this behaviour. There is strong evidence to show that poor educational opportunities and poor health 
PTSD, aggressive behaviour and violence correlate closely with the army providing the conditions for these to come together. Recruiting campaigns have recently targeted those who have performed poorly in their GCSEs, targeted them very explicitly on social media. They promised them that they can address these failures through education services in the armed forces. Yet the elementary nature of these military qualifications means that after discharge from the service, this cohort remained disadvantaged with regard to future social and employment prospects. A situation made even more difficult given the life skill sets learned in the infantry, for example. The question of consent for enlistment under the, age of, under the age of 18 is crucial, and at this point it's worth quoting the report in full. The authors state that the minimum age rules for children are a means for society to protect children from decisions and activities that may be harmful to them or others. In the UK, you cannot legally buy alcohol cigarettes until you're 18. You cannot drive until you're 17, but you can be recruited into the armed forces aged 16. In the NHS, the minimum age for individual consent for a medical procedure is 16. But for this consent to be valid, it must also be voluntary and informed. And the person consenting must have the capacity to make an informed decision. For the decision to be voluntary, it must be made without undue influence or pressure from others. For it to be informed, all known information with respect to consequent benefits, risks and alternatives must be provided in a way that can be understood and internalised as part of a decision making process. In the, in the NHS, patients are also entitled to withdraw consent to treatment at any time. More importantly, many of the preconditions for voluntary and informed consent are not being met. This is primarily because marketing and recruitment practices do not involve the provision of balanced information. The army requires only that recruits have entry level two literacy and numeracy qualifications. The national school curriculum equivalent for attainment at ages seven to nine. However, despite this policy, in 2015, the Army was shown to have enlisted recruits with literary skills entry level one, equivalent to the reading age of a five to seven year old. According to a study of state, state secondary schools in Greater London, which were visited by Army recruiters between September and, uh, 2008 and April 2009, children from the most social, socially economic disadvantaged backgrounds were contacted more often by the Army uh, recruiters than other children. In sum, the discussion on child soldiers in the UK, something we don't necessarily put together, illuminates a further element of the ways in which the armed forces has and continues to act in largely unaccountable ways through its engagement with young people. This element leads to the next, where I consider the internal and informal politics of the armed forces as one way in which to challenge the idea that the institution maintains a safe distance from the political realm. Now, created in 2010, the Army Rumour Service, referred to by its acronym ARS, is, according to its Facebook page, the UK's largest online military community. It is stated, stated that it is the British Army's unofficial community that contains a vast collection of information, humour and bullshit entirely created by the users of the site. 200,000 people per month contribute towards and enjoy the site by the Army for the Army. On this site, you can find a wide range of resources. And to give you a flavor, there are forums entitled Current News and Analysis, House of Commons, MOD News, the 2021 Integrated Defense Review, Afghanistan, Syria, Mali, Libya, Middle East, and North Africa, and Brexit. Now, notwithstanding the limitations of analyzing online material, whereby it's often very difficult to establish the veracity of those posting in terms, in this instance, of a status of serving or former serving UK Army personnel, it is quite clear that a number of the narratives generated on the site chime closely with the findings of wider research into the culture of the armed forces. Located in their broader context, the findings discussed here resonate with others documented in numerous policy reports, for example, I'll mention a few of those shortly. And as such, their status goes well beyond mere anecdote generated by so-called bad apples who function as problematic outliers to the wider culture. Rather, they reflect clearly discernible internal structures of feeling and ways of seeing, as the literary theorists Raymond Williams and John Berger might put it. At this point, it is worth stating that the sentiments expressed around women, homosexuals and racialized people on the site, to take a number of examples, is reminiscent of my own days of service. The stability of these tropes is in itself telling and is indicative of the armed forces enduring social structures, 
that speak not only to the unexceptional status of these views on minorities, but rather underscores just how far they remain a common currency of everyday army banter. Whilst it's undoubtedly the case that many of the posts on the site would be deemed transgressive and likely closed down if uttered, if uttered publicly within the institution itself, they continue to circulate amongst and within particular army subcultures. Their degrees of acceptance vary between time and place, and there exists a real empirical deficit here regarding fine-grained understandings of the extent of these belief systems and the subcultures through and by which they are propagated. The online world is anonymized in ways, as we are only too aware, that facilitate extreme views and the interlocutors remain wholly unaccountable for them. This raises the intriguing question of how far the online world has acted to stymie the modernization of the armed forces and many other traditional institutions, given the productive impact of non-accountable non outlets such as the Army Rumour Service, that in turn might be explained by the views, attitudes and beliefs imported into the armed forces by particular groups. So in taking a number of illustrative postings, I open with commentary on Jeremy Corbyn. The first point to note is that unlike the ways in which the current Prime Minister is referred to using both Christian and surname Boris Johnson, or as a term of endearment Bojo, or most popularly, most popularly simply Boris, the former leader of the opposition was always referred to as Corbyn. Although a nominal point in both senses of the word, the degree to which he is demonised, a trend practised by virtually the entire media of the UK in the lead up to the 2019 election, is noteworthy. Sometimes branded a terrorist, sometimes a dangerous Russophile, and sometimes disparaged as disabled, Jeremy Corbyn has invoked the ire of a range of people across his political career. For example, the image of Jeremy, Jeremy, Corbyn, ride, Jeremy Corbyn riding a bike on, uh, is responded to with the following post on the website. He looks like the poster child for names of disability society. The sentiments expressed towards the left are invariably conflated with communism. Frequent targets of the army forum include benefit scroungers, the so-called woke, and others cast as dangerous in their critiques of social injustice of one kind or another. Edit, edited here for the purposes of brevity, though still lengthy, is the following post. The current crop of agitprop commies in the Labour Party have the patronising view of the poor as some homogenous part of the population who are permanently exploited by the middle classes. A rapacious desire to bleed them dry so that they can send Tabitha and Tarquin to independent schools. The poor are incapable of ambition and drive and depend on their betters, i.e. the liberal intelligentsia of the middle class like Owen Jones, to articulate their needs and desires for them and who should be gratefully dependent on them for whatever crumbs they scatter. As the Owens of this world hate every single institution of the state they don't control, such as the armed forces, they view any 16-year-old lad who thinks about joining up as either naively exploited or worse still, a traitor to the vision they have for the working poor, who they presume are filled with the same contempt for themselves that they are. In relation to an individual who raised concerns about recruiting children into the armed forces, uh, in uh, another individual uh, posts the following. She's biased and brainwashed, uninformed halfwit, spouting tired and baseless lefty cliches that were out of date 50 years ago. Like most of her ilk, the whole subject to defence is in her mind all covered under empire toffs and general Tory nastiness. And any factual knowledge of the subject is wholly unnecessary and a waste of time. When the government is sending kidnapped 13-year-olds from council estates to Afghanistan to search for mines in their bare feet when it should be addressing transgender issues for the under fives or something. Now, more recent threads have focused on the deeply controversial 2021 report, Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, where one individual parodying evidence-led response to the report stated that its critics deemed it to be nonsense. According to experts on the Jeremy Vine show, the whole thing is utter rubbish and their entire nation is more racist than Hitler. That's us told then. Some of that stuff in the article is pure spoof. Also following the race report and focused on another group that attracts the regular ire of posters is a caricatured lefty student, as noted in the following. Students living and studying in Britain feel they're being colonised. Students burn the national flag of the country they live in. They protest at being asked not to have haircuts. That blocked the view of others. I know what they mean. Massive afros. 
But it would be amusing if someone said they felt they couldn't express themselves because Ahmed has a centre party. On questions of race and the Formula One driver, Lewis Hamilton, another posted, aside from being very much into music and film, he mainly seems to live for seeking out worldwide race and LGBTQ plus inequality stories in the news. He married a transgender Muslim so he can really flex his lefty credentials and posting rants about it and having a seething, all-consuming hatred for the Tories and his own country, unless it's the Labour vision of it. Now, these are very uncomfortable things to, to read, but I mean, they, 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 they are very frequent on the website. If you visit it, you can find them, of course, in various ways. Various intriguing explanations are proposed in response to the controversies invoked by the race report, where, once again, communism, of all things, rears its ugly head. The race industry wants the opposite of a harmonious society. They want division and racial tensions. They want riots and bloodshed. They want racism, both from whites and from ethnic minorities. Why? Because almost without exception, those lambasting the report, most of whom haven't read it, are communists. They are simply enabling their doctrine. <laughs> it's only by destroying the existing society and making life truly terrible for everyone will society choose communism as a solution to their problems. Anyone who's travelled outside the UK, basically anywhere, can see how decent the UK is compared to just about everywhere else. Why the fuck do people think millions of non-UK people wish to move to the UK? We're the most reasonable and decent country I've ever visited. With regards to race and acceptance, and, and, and if, although you will always find racists, not just white, there are plenty of black and brown racists, e.g. Diane Abbott and most of the Labour front bench. Generally, the UK is not racist, but the likes of BLM and the white liberal elite are doing everything in their power to turn us all into racists. E.g. that twat Lewis Hamilton, who I used to respect. My patience for people tell me I've got white privilege and inherent racism has completely gone. And if they want segregation, they can blinking well have it as far as I'm concerned. Now, this post was followed up <coughs> not by reference to communism, but Marxism. Don't worry, in time, the historical insignificance and context of the Marxist Black Lives Matter movement will be realised. And some people who are interested in racial harmony and removing the cancer that is identity politics will be along to rip it down. It can then go and stand in the Museum of Slavery and Racism next to Colson's statue. And a display can be put up which explains fully what BLM was about and what it was looking to achieve. Now, another very dominant thread on the site is the ways in which the, the poorest in society are discussed. Somebody posted, Bolivia has the right idea, changing labour laws to allow children to be sent out to work from 10. Another posted, why don't we dose McDonald's with con contraceptives, contraceptives activated by a subliminal message on Jeremy Kyle, sorted. Another said, some of these feral types who show no parental respons responsibility traits or possess any personal integrity, it makes one wonder whether there could be some sort of final solution. <coughs> we don't have Australia anymore, posted another. Maybe send them to the Isle of Wight where they wouldn't notice a sudden influx of inbreds. Other threads focused on women, and most recently the Sarah Everard vigil held on Clapham Common, where it's commented that these women believe that they have different and greater rights to men. Another contributed to this thread by posting, the organisers missed a trick, they should have labelled it black and gingerhead women's lives matter, and all would have been cool. And yet another posted the following, um, and in so doing blamed the vic murder victim herself. I am sorry this, the girl, Sarah Evard, died, but if she'd been obeying the COVID guidance, she wouldn't have left home to go and visit a friend. A bit of self-inflicted here, I think. The overall tone of racist and sexist and at times deeply misogynistic postings on the website, um, one example celebrates a potential rape of Greta Thunberg, speak to a deeply divisive rather than unifying politics that continues on from this rather grim set of uh, understandings and framings into Brexit, where one member argued that the UK has dodged a bullet. Personally, I couldn't care less what happens to the EU. Now we are finally leaving a rat infested hellhole. They can keep their migrants, bail out poor countries, collapse the euro, turn into another third world shithole because as far as UK taxpayer is concerned, it's not our problem anymore. Invoking mainstream political rhetoric around Brexit, the thread continues. We'll trade with the world, make our own laws, say who's allowed in our country and who can use NHS and claim benefits, etc. 
Now, unsurprisingly, given the centrality of the armed forces to ideas of nationalism, were other such posts as, fuck the EU, they've shown they're not our friends, but are just dictators. And we also know from history how that works out in the long run. Now, the main theme of this talk has been on how we might think politics otherwise in the case of the armed forces. This requires us to challenge a series of taken for granted assumptions that include beliefs around institutions, democratic accountability to parliament, and in certain circumstances on the ultimate authority of the prime minister. It also raises issues around attempts to both create and neutralize its, its exceptional status through various political strategies. And finally, that it is clear that elements of its subcultural features remain highly problematic. What I've shown is that the institution is a vibrant and heterogeneous site of informal politics that, whilst being characterised characterized by largely middle ground yet anti-left liberal views, also proves unable to successfully eradicate its extreme right subcultures that have endured through time. Occasionally the mask slips and these views are laid bare. Illustrative examples include, include the headline in the Sunday Telegraph, MI5 swoops on army neo-Nazis alongside frequent reporting about the continued traction that both racism and sexism has in the services. Commissioned by the former, former Secretary of State for Defence, Gavin Williamson, in 2019, it is noticed that the data drawn from a wide range of institutional and other sources shows that a significant number of our people have experienced bullying, discrimination and harassment, including sexual harassment. Female and BAME personnel are overrepresented in these statistics. Interestingly, and adhering to this so-called bad apple trope that I mentioned earlier, is that these practices can be blamed on the pack mentality of white middle-aged men, especially in positions of influence, whose behaviours are shaped by the armed forces of 20 years ago. Yet, there remains a deep contradiction at the heart of the report, one that mimics the race report where, whereby structures of racism are disavowed. To borrow from the scholar Adam Elliot Cooper's understanding of racism, which refers to the ways in which the normal functioning of the police in this case, in his case, and for our case, armed forces, it is clear to see just how far it fits with his definition. In this sense, the armed forces produce racist outcomes, whether it be amongst their workforce or overseas in the case of the latter, it is black and brown people that are othered as the enemy. These are not necessarily, however, as Cooper reminds us, the result of malicious and evil bigots, though they can be, as the forum posting suggests, but rather are made possible by the structures, cultures and organisational thinking that animates the ways the world is seen and the military practices that flow from them. Interestingly, the Wigson report does move towards this understanding, thereby undermining its bad apple framing of a pack of middle-aged middle -aged white men by recommending that culture change is actually part, uh, part aim of the report. Other instances of this anti-left stance come in the form of the recent media exposure of footage showing members of the British Army using a photo of Jeremy Corbyn for target practice in what a senior officer called a serious error of judgment. Brigadier Nick Perry, commander of 16 Air Assault Brigade, said the soldiers involved had engaged in inappropriate behaviour following a serious error of judgment. Though the politics of such an act are clear and once again are seen to be the preserve of a rogue few, as the former soldier and now MP Johnny Mercer stated. Every organisation has good people who make serious misjudgments. Now, my aim in this talk has not been to exceptionalise armed forces as villains, but rather to gesture to the larger political structures within, within which they are embedded. The armed forces are deeply allied, with, deeply allied with establishment political ethos that, in a contemporary period, under the Johnson government, has made a distinct and extreme shift to the right and, in turn, emboldened those whose parallel views had hitherto, to a degree at least, been relatively discredited and suppressed. Yet the key point is that strict guidelines exist for armed forces personnel, armed forces personnel engagement with politics. These have a lengthy history where in 1889, Lord Wolseley amended a pre-existing prohibition on involvement in politics for the army to read, officers, non-commissioned officers and private soldiers are forbidden to institute or take part in any meetings, demonstrations or processions for party or political purposes in barracks, quarters or camps or their vicinity. And under no circumstances, whatever uh, will they do so in uniform. Now, the current Queen's regulations state that regular service personnel are not to take part in the affairs of any political organisation, party or movement. They are not to participate in political marches or demonstrations. 
All forms of political activity, including political meetings and speeches, are prohibited in service establishments. Conceived of in a sense that captures the empirical reality sketched here, the armed forces, of course, can be seen as both a political organisation and a political event. Partaking in Armed Forces Day, as one example, is an act that is far from politically neutral, is a clear demonstration of support for a conservative political ideology. In this way, and drawing on the work of those who have focused on processes of militarization indicated above, is the observation that increasingly practices around, forces, around the armed forces have shifted from remembrance to celebration. Indeed, the choice to enlist, a notion that in itself requires careful consideration given the disproportionate number of the army's lower ranks that are drawn from the poorest communities in the nation, is in itself an unambiguous political statement. There can be nothing more political than agreeing to use violence on behalf of the state <coughs> to kill and injure others while sim simultaneously agreeing to enact state policy that is at time questioned by a significant proportion of its citizenry requiring force for that question. Moreover, these violent acts, whether at a distance or face to face, are invariably justified through particular geopolitical aspirations, as well as with increasing politicization of the armed forces themselves. <coughs> as we step further back, and locate the armed forces in their wider context with the arms trade that is itself driven by political economies grounded in corruption, symbolism, jingoism and profit, swearing one's allegiance to an unelected figurehead whose authority is, is essentially feudal, the Queen, reminds us of how undemocratic the entire process is. In this sense, we note a politics of subjective, subjectification, whereby serving men and women become vectors of a politics that is hidden in plain sight. Taken from the British Army's Standards and Values Guide, we gain some insight into the explicit recognition that soldiers, in this example, are indeed expected to fulfil the political demands of the nation, where it is stated that professional officers and soldiers serve the legitimate political objectives of a nation. This distinguishes them from non-state actors, terrorists and mercenaries. However, key questions are raised here around who determines whether or not the aims of military violence are legitimate, as we saw Afghanistan and Iraq are cases in point, that in turn rest on the democratic deficit intrinsic to the UK's first past the post electoral system. It also underscores some of the ways in which the state, in this case, can have its political cake and eat it. And it is that point that I will leave the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Whilst you've been talking, I've received a number of comments and uh, questions, which I will now relate to you. Um, if, if anybody else has got any more questions, and I've just seen one, oh, I've just seen uh, from John Kelly, where he said, thanks, Paul. So um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I mean, one of the points that has come forward from the chat is that it's all very depressing. <laughs> Do you have any comment on that before I ask a specific question? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, um, it is. I mean, I, I, I think um, for those of you who know me, you may, well, you'll know that I've pitched this in a very provocative sense, of course. Um, and of course, I've been quite selective on how I frame this in a far more negative light than, you know, potentially it could be framed. Um, and I do that, you know, as a way to stimulate discussion um, as much as, you know, maintain perhaps interest in a different line of thought that, that we see with the armed forces that are generally kind of eulogised as a kind of great institution of British society. So that's, yeah, that's how, that's how I work. OK, well, I'm going to start on the questions that came in now. We've got about six that I'll, that I'll work through and there are probably some more coming through. So first of all, from Diana and Nick Francis. Uh, thank you so much for your truth telling. Would you agree that militarism uh, as such is the embodiment of toxic masculinity? Punching above one's weight and world beating are toxic militarist metaphors. How can we change this culture? <laughs> um, I think that's a really interesting observation. I like the idea of, um, I find it quite um, useful to think about uh, the, the relationship of toxic masculinity to, to militarization. I think it is an extremely gendered process for sure, so I completely agree. Um, I think, uh, I mean, what I would say, what I, what I would say in, in answer to can we change things is, you know, 
my my kind of political project is you know my career if you like has been after many years of thinking about this work and, and, and applying myself to the literature and and based on my own experiences we should be moving towards demilitarization of various kinds um i mean i think that um you know that the, the 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 notion of demilitarization is often poo-pooed and i think we should be looking at particularly you know when you look at the integrated defense review is you know the need for a mass standing army um has definitely you know shifted in light of perceived threats around the world and cyber threats etc and so on and so forth so i think you know those kinds of um elements of national security are perhaps less gendered um and per perhaps you know do, do not have those kinds of toxic elements in the way that i've suggested uh you know in, in this talk okay thank you now penny law uh, makes a point that i kind of noticed as well she says a great deal of this talk is about the ill effects of the military life on men and boys mainly what is the effect of the military service on women and girls. Now you mentioned about the toxic sexism and racism, but what's the kind of direct, are there, are there direct impacts on women and girls? I mean, I think what I would say in response to that is that there is a consistent flow of um, reporting of, of uh, you know, the, the, the kind of deeply sexist nature of the armed forces. Um, and it's difficult to avoid. I mean, you can pick up the media and you can find it. And, and you know, people are frequently publishing books, you know, who've, who've had experiences of those kinds of circumstances, females who, who served. So I think, you know, I, I mean, what I find most fascinating, I suppose, having been involved in the armed forces, you know, growing up as a child, having a dad in the armed forces, brothers, etc., throughout my whole period, um, is, is how little things actually really have changed in a sense. Things have gone underground in terms of sexism or racism. They, they, it's not legitimate to articulate those views in quite the same way, but, you know, the, the power differentials are, are remarkably stable. Um, and I think the negative effects on women, um, you know, remain largely uh, unchanged. OK. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask a question now, um, but then I'll be coming on to uh, Peter Chandler's questions and the others. Um, I get the feeling, and I mean, this is from a position of no knowledge at all, but I kind of get the feeling that the way that, or the things that you've described about the British armed forces would be very much paralleled by the American armed forces. You may or may not agree with that, but um, I just wonder if a completely different kind of armed force, um, like, for example, the Israeli army has got the same sort uh, i mean they've got their own problems you know I, i'm i'm not in any way an apologist for the israeli state but i just find it interesting that their army is generally a conscripted army uh, and they conscript women and men into it very freely i wonder if there's any aspects of that kind of armed force that are less toxic than what we see in the UK and probably in the US? Uh, I mean, uh, so the question, David, if I've got you right, is are there, be are there better, less damaging militaries around if that's... Yeah, yes. I find it difficult to believe, but I'm just asking the question. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, first of all, I should say, I'll carry out this by saying I'm not by any means a specialist on other armed forces. Um, some may say I'm not a specialist on the British armed forces, which is fine, but... Um, one thing I have noticed throughout the years of doing research is armed forces cultures are remarkably similar no matter where you go. They kind of transcend cultural contexts in interesting ways, particularly around questions of gender. So you can visit armies in Pakistan, in India, in you know, the US, and you find very similar kinds of gender dynamics in play. So, you know, from the perspective of my own work on military masculinity, you will find very similar, um, very similar kinds of gender relations and, and, and the social outcomes that go with those. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, 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 there's a drive in the kind of more liberal side of the literature on militaries in, in, in sociology and in military studies to say, well, all we need to do is have lots more women in the military or make a better place. You know, we need to regender the military, we may, need to make it more compassionate, more friendly, etc. No, I think that's deeply problematic. I mean, I'm, I kind of think that, um, you know, in a more feminist kind of perspective on that might be. You know, do we want to be as good as the men, as good as the men at killing other people? Is that what feminism is all about? You know, so I, I'm I'm actually much more radically in my thinking around this. Um, you know, in in a sense, um, I just think that you know armed forces are remarkably similar. Um, do, okay. You know, you know, transculturally. 
Thank you very much. Now, um, a couple of comments from uh, Peter Chandler. Um, the armed forces don't seem to be very successful at winning funding, maintaining manpower, etc., and certainly not successful at winning any agreement on joined up defence strategy. So a little bit away from some of the things that you were talking about, but coming back to the interforces rivalry and the like. Is... Yeah. Um, I mean, quick reflection. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I think of the aircraft carriers and the vast sums of money that have been invested in those, the billions, when you mentioned into service rivalry. Um, I mean, I think that the armed forces are pretty successful compared to other arms of the state at generating income from the government. I think that, you know, and the recent, obviously, integrated defence review does, <coughs> as I mentioned in the presentation, you know, does, you know, give, give its serving personnel a bigger pay rise than, than other public sector workers. But I mean, it has, over the years, um, I mean, you know, you, what is the right amount of funding for the armed forces? I mean, I, I you know, I think with the, with the, with the, um, the increase, the proposed increase in nuclear stockpiles, you know, that's going to cost many, I don't know, billions, I'm not sure how much, but I mean, I, you know, and it's, it seems to be the case that certain things around national security are just taken for granted as, 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 as you know, as they should be funded, right? They, there's no real discussion about, you know, whether or not that's, that's uh, going to take away from the welfare state or education or whatever. So uh, they, they, they have quite a bit of power, I think, I kind of, would, that's how I would see it. Okay. Right. Now, from John Kelly, can you comment on the civil military relationship in terms of British public and their culpability slash responsibility for the violence conducted on their behalf and paid for by their taxes? I.e., when does the citizen become culpable themselves for the military of his, her nation state? Excellent question. I don't know who asked that. That's a really good question. Well, um, that was John Kelly. If okay. you want to. <laughs> I mean, the question of culpability is really interesting, isn't it? So um, I think, I mean, I don't know, but my sense is that in an everyday lay sense, we kind of trust that the armed forces are being deployed appropriately and that, you know, the campaigns are deployed, uh, you know, the, the, the campaigns are involved in a legitimate, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, you know. So, so I suppose culpability, the, the culpability or the, the, the relationship with the, kind of wider citizenry is one that says something like well you know if your media is full of this stuff supporting it which generally it is and even if you know the, the nature of conflict is disputed you know supporting our boys and girls is a very dominant trope in the media then individuals in their everyday sense who are busy with all sorts of other things going on in their lives you know probably find that acceptable so you know i think part part of the problem is in a very personal view is I think our media is diabolical in this country. We just don't have a good media. You know, I've been looking increasingly to the US to see like the New York Times are really taking on Trump or whatever. We just don't have anything here which really challenges the government. I mean, I find it breathtaking. There's, you know, it, it, there's nothing. I mean, it's, it's generally, it's all pretty kind of liberal to the right, more or less. Okay. Um, thank you. Now I've got question comment from Paul Breen who he writes unsurprisingly from growing up across the water uh, but I find it strange how there is so little public opposition to the military myth in British society what are why are the public so unwilling to question this myth well I think it, it goes back to the ways in which you know we are kind of socialized uh, to believe the military is a, a you know a force for good in society um, and I mean when you you might have seen the images that came up you know children are exposed to this myth from the youngest of ages um, and I think that drip drip really does shape you know or or influence the extent to which you know real opposition can arise um, and and, and I, I, I think that you know for that reason and like I said about the media and all the rest of it I think there is a and, and obviously long history to this you know um, in not least World War Two, which is of, of, often you know a common trope that we'll see trotted out at whatever you know event, um, does does is a very powerful kind of uh, rallying point of of national identity, and and I just think it's you know it does render passive or you know does kind of um, erode the kind of agency of those to really you know gain any decent traction. And I mean we shouldn't ignore the fact that you know there are organisations. I mean. 
you know, veterans of peace and others, you know, amongst many that, that are, you know, actively resisting militarism and militarization. So, um, but again, you know, they're, they're relatively on the margins and not really receiving much publicity, I guess. Okay. Right, now I've got a question from Matthew Olford. Uh, what would be the easiest way to cut the military? Where should deployments be drawn down? I've heard it said that some sort of, oh dear, impo that it's impossible to make the military much smaller. Similarly with Trident, is there a way to have very minimal deterrent, half a dozen bombs, or does it have to be half, oh, sorry, or does it have to be all or nothing? Well, I, I, I mean, in a sense, the, the, the integrated review, which I think, as I recall, is is going to be aiming for a sort of seventy five thousand odd personnel in the army, which is a massive cut, you know, to what we saw in twenty years ago, is a nod to the fact of, you know, is a nod to this changing security situation as it as it's seen. So, um, I I think if that if that narrative of the changing security situation that does not require a military response gains real traction then I, you could see how that might work i mean you could see how the armed forces might you know in terms of pure manpower be you know be you know sh shrunk even further and i th i think that's that's the key really is is that you know when we look at afghanistan we look at iraq you know counterinsurgency were fighting and you know the the, the kind of long term guerrilla type warfares that characterize these kinds of conflicts cannot easily be won if at all by military intervention so so i think there's there's a huge scope for getting that narrative out there which is about you know how to tackle and deal with you know situations that would you know militaries themselves are keen to get involved in and governments you know obviously promote militaries and the, the reasons for that which link right back to the military industrial complex and those who seek to gain but but actually the reality is you know military interventions have been pretty useless i would say in fact less than useless i mean facilitate isis in the case of iraq for example and the you know the resurgence of the taliban in afghanistan i mean what's all that for trillions and trillions of dollars and, and what what has it achieved and th this is the essence really of the question about military defense okay um, i've got three or four more questions uh, on the chat thing but i'm going to ask another one myself um because that's i, I can do that um i i kind of feel well first of all I found a lot of what you said, most of what you said, I agree with. A lot of it I didn't know, but when you explained it, I thought, yes, that's that's right. At the same point, recognising that there are wars and that somebody probably needs to fight them, um, I, I feel very grateful to those people who are willing to basically you know, risk their lives to fight those wars on my behalf. And it's not necessarily a war that, uh, the, that Britain has instigated, but one that we've just got drawn into. And I'm not talking about the First World War or the Second World War, because they were conscription wars. I'm talking where we've actually got the professional military taking place. And one war or one bit of fighting that I felt, and maybe you're going to disabuse me with this, was where we actually did some good was the involvement in Kosovo, for example, where, you know, that stopped ethnic cleansing. It stopped thousands of people being killed. And I think that was a good thing that the UK did. You know, when I look at Tony Blair's time as prime minister, I could give him a tick for that. Um, maybe a bit too late, but whatever. So how do we, if you like, manage this uh, conflict between recognising that there are wars going on we need somebody to fight them every now and then we need to be grateful to these people who are doing it with all the issues that you raise well i mean i agree with you i mean i think you know there are certain instances kosovo being one um and actually i did research in kosovo and i i you know i i even having visited there and spent some time there doing research it, it came home to me that that was a necessary intervention some might disagree with me so um there are wars uh which can be justified uh, in that sense, but but actually, probably they're few and far between. Um, and so, I suppose the second part of your kind of point really is we should be grateful. Indeed, I am very grateful. You know, I'm grateful that you know this kind of responsibility to protect under the kind of UN, UN convention, whatever is is whatever mandates in place and involves British troops. You know, can be 
you know, does require, you know, volunteers to go and fight those wars. And I, I don't have any, you know, disagreement with that. I mean, I just think that, you know, what we need to do is we need to have a, a much more, um, a much more lively and active debate going back to some of the questions that have been raised earlier in, in, you know, earlier about the legitimacy of certain conflicts. So I think of Iraq, I mentioned in the, um, presentation you know many millions around the world marched i mean a mil one to two million marched in london you know and yet um blair had already decided to go to war those kinds of things uh those kinds of things are deeply problematic um and and, and in that particular case they ref that, you know that they can be traced in part to the kind of special so-called special relationship with the us which you know is another fundamental issue really to be dealt with but i think overall there's just there's there's bit, for various reasons, there's lack of a really healthy debate in this country and what it means for a more kind of uh, democratic um, kind of approach to, to intervention. OK, um, now I've got uh, a question from well, a, a comment, really, but I think you would want to respond to this uh, from John Edison. He says this is uh, an academic presentation of a particularly biased left wing viewpoint or an expression of a personal bias which does not recognise alternative, more positive values, both within the armed forces and for the national benefit? Come on. Um, yeah, it's left-wing bias, if that's how you see it. I don't have any worry about saying that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I'm very much against use of military force, if at all possible. And, um, you know, I base my thinking on you know, research um, on, you know, on, on the empirical record on, on, you know, not just, you know, secondary, but primary research as well. And that's the, that's the, that's the viewpoint I've reached after many years of thinking about this and studying it. So um, I, I don't disagree. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a question from Paul Breen. Uh, Ray, this discussion on military cultures, what about neutral armies like those of Switzerland or Ireland? Um, that's a really excellent question. And uh, again, I, I don't feel qualified to speak to those particular places. I don't really have any knowledge, actually, to be fair, of, of how things work culturally in those contexts. Um, I mean, I would mention at this point that um, uh, Costa Rica doesn't have an army at all. Um, and that's an interesting case study, just just for information that people might want to think about too. Um, but but I, 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 yeah, I really don't know. It's, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, now, Georgina Holmes uh, supported Paul Breen's uh, comment there and says that's a very good question, Paul. I wonder if, by definition, a military always has to have an enemy, enemies, and therefore certain groups of people that will be othered. Any comment? Yeah, I mean, I think what I'd say is, you know, it's not easy to get people to kill other people. It's a really difficult process. And uh, there's a long history of, of what that looks like, you know, from work by uh, a marshal of the Second World War showing that, you know, most people were not firing at the enemy. They couldn't bring themselves to do it. Um, what you have to do and why the armed forces is, is the kind of institution it is, is you have to isolate people from civilian society in order to provide the situation and conditions under which they can then uh you know kill people um and part of that process is you must dehumanize the enemy otherwise you 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 know you have too much affinity with the, with the other so the othering is 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 integral really and, and and actually that's one of the issues with with um people leaving the armed forces is of course they have been subject to these you know deep intense in, in, intensive processes about othering civilians of various kinds or other you know individuals that are not themselves if you like and so that's that's in part helps to explain you know how much work has to be done in order to kind of um, um, break out of those kinds of mindsets and, and, and the legacy of those training regimes. You almost seem to suggest however that if, if we did break out of these training regimes perhaps the armies the British army wouldn't be able to do what it's expected to do. Well I think that that's it's it's kind of made more complicated by by the kind of uh, technological realm which is you know using drones and uh, you know um, un uh, um, unmanned aerial vehicles drones which of course are killing at a distance and in a much more kind of abstract way for those you know involved in those processes so i think what we saw in afghanistan 
and to a large extent, Iraq was the you know the, the most intense period of face to face fighting we'd seen since the Second World War. And I think what you see from those encounters is this level of PTSD, um, which you know is significant, and, and all the sorts of problems that are generated from those kinds of encounters. You, now that said, those operating drones are also reporting high levels of PTSD. So part of the reason for that is not necessarily the, the fact that, you know, the, the killing aspect is the fact that they can be RF Waddington in a vehicle, in a, in a porter cabin, killing somebody and then drive home for tea with their wife. I mean, these kinds of transitions make it extremely difficult for individuals to readjust in those kinds of mm. short, uh, you know, bursts of time, really. OK, now, uh, Anne Berrier uh, recommends um, uh, a website, https www.war.school, um, and a, a number of people have said thank you uh, for recommending that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not promoting it, I don't know anything about it, but uh, I'm sure those of you who are interested will, yeah. will look, at that, look at that website. I've got a couple of uh, points left from the audience. Um, from Peter Chandler, how important is qualifying for the special relationship in the in military bureaucratic politics in Whitehall? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I did, is, sorry, is the question, of, I'm not quite clear, sorry, what the question is. It's about the special relationship. Well, and I think it's asking, um, obviously, the special relationship is something that... The, British Prime Ministers in particular talk about yeah. a lot, um, how, um, how much the front is it in terms uh, of the military bureaucratic politics in Whitehall? Is it something that they think about? Let's make sure that we cover that off. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little bit outside my area of expertise. I mean, um, my suspicion is that, I mean, armed forces people are generally very practical. And uh, I think a lot of that special relationship narrative has been driven by the politicians, to be honest. Um, I don't think that, um, you know, and, and actually, to be honest with you, I mean, informally, you know, the US, uh, the UK armed forces don't always like working with the US armed forces for various reasons. So, you know, perhaps this is a political thing rather than a military thing. Yeah, I think you're probably right. So. Um, OK, Anne has provided a, a, an explanation about war school that everybody can read in terms of, from chat. But I've got a last question now, Paul, and then we can wrap up. Um, I'm actually, I'm not sure if it's a question or not, so let me read it out to you. I'm not sure it's actually left wing to want to avoid war. A lot of leftists are keener on fighting than the Conservatives. Um, <laughs> Oh, hold on. That's just jumped. Uh, no need to respond. Thank you for your answer to my earlier question. OK, so it wasn't a question. It was just okay. a, a comment. Um, she would love to know. Oh, sorry. Matthew would love to know if there's a video of this chat that I could show my British politics students. Smiley. Well, um, Matthew, we, we have recorded this talk and it will be made available on the Brilsey uh, YouTube, uh, virtu on the virtual BRLSI YouTube channel in a month or so. So uh, when, it's, when it comes out, you'll be able to find it there. Um, and I've got a final comment here from uh, John Kelly, and then quite a few thanks coming in. Blair Cameron, May Danat, and numerous officials have emphasised the importance to the armed forces of feeling that they are supported. One could argue the military agency campaigns you outlined, from sport to armed forces day to kids playing, etc., become necessary tools to provide stages for such performance. Last comment back. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think the armed forces are very much dependent on, a bit more so, uh, you know, since I suppose, you know, the first TV war, the Vietnam War, on public support. Um, you know, and I think when you look at Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, you can see that actually the, the defining character of the, you know, w w whether or not that those conflicts were to keep going was public support. So I think that's right. Um, but what it the, the, the issue, I suppose, is public support is a twin edged thing. So if you want the British public to support the armed forces and to have an affinity with the armed forces, when those body bags come back, that makes it more difficult for them to support the armed forces. Whereas if there was less, or the, the, let's say the military was more remote 
those kinds of very poignant reminders of, of what's going on, you know, would, would be less so. And therefore, you know, the armed forces, so the armed forces have got a kind of tightrope to, to walk really in, in terms of support and, you know, being remote really from the um, wider public. Okay. Paul, thank you very much. Your talk has um, left me thinking about things in somewhat different way to what I have done before. Um, so that's good. Thank you from me. Thank you from everybody else. There's lots of comments come in uh, saying how uh, great they thought it was. And uh, also other people uh, commenting on the um, on the uh, website that uh, Anna Beria um, mentioned, the War School one. So um, I would like to formally thank you. If everybody wants to turn on their microphone now, we can give Paul a round of applause. And thank you very much for spending his time. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hi, Matthew. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for your support, everybody. That was really kind of you and great questions. Thanks so much. Thanks, Paul. Okay, it's time for a glass of wine for me. So. <laughs> okay, thanks again, David. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, have you gone? No, I'm here. Yeah, you're still here. I've just got to take back the host to stop the recording. Yeah, yeah. Reclaim host. OK. Stop recording. OK, I've done that. Right. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. I... I mean, I knew about Armed Forces Day and things like that, but the way in particular that you explained about, you know, the 16 year old children joining the army and the other forces. Um, and, you know, I'm a magistrate and, you know, I, I, I don't work in the youth court and, you know, the, you have to have a special training to deal with people who are under 18. And yet, as you say, these are the kids who get indoctrinated at an early age and often face the brunt of the worst of the battles. So something to think about. Thank you very much. OK, OK. All right. Sorry, it's a bit gloomy. Now, well, I, as, as I said, the important thing is to get people thinking. Yeah. We don't want everything that everybody just kind of uh, can blatantly agree with. You want to have some challenge. So, yeah. Cheers okay. for that. Good. Good. Bye -bye. Excellent. All right. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Bye. bye.